just checking out if there's any chat going on. Um, so I'm really excited because I thought, I thought for this video, I was going to be able to say that we officially had, oh, woke him running. He knew I was doing a live video. So he has to come and rub on the tripod. Um, yeah, I thought maybe I would officially have everything planted, all of my fall planting done. Um, but I was just talking to Nelly uh, and she said that we just found a few more daffodils, but we had 9,000 tulips done and we got uh, 750 peonies and done. And we had 3,000 daffodils to plant and that I was a little nervous about because we were, oh, wow, you're so bad. Um, we were planting a bunch of those uh, ind like individually. Like we bought a tool, a stand-up bulb planter, which is like a handled shovel that has like a hole. Um, and I was like, okay, one at a time. We're going to get them in. It's going to take forever because there was 3,000 of them. Um, but we're almost there. There's only like a hundred left. So that still, that still feels like, it feels like success for me. So I'm feeling really good. Um, I like, I was working on a video. I was, I came, I, I stopped the video to come down here to talk to you guys. Um, and for it, oh, Bo, you're so bad. You're so bad. Um, for the video, I was going through some footage from last year. Oh, everyone's interrupting Ian's guy too. That's good. You can come say hi. Um, yeah, we were, I was looking at the footage from last year, which had like six inches of snow on the ground and we're trying to plant and it looked just, I looked so cold and so miserable. So it hasn't snowed yet. Um, it is above zero <laughs> on these days when we're working. Um, it is not December. It's not a new year and everything's done. So it feels like success. Feels good. Are you? I could share. I just have to hold Bo. Yeah, I understand. He's, yep, I already. Well, he he's like doing his best to oh, knock the being, camera over. He's being demanding. Yeah, because more I've been putting this on the table lately because you drives me crazy how he rubs on it. Yeah. What have you been doing? We're, I said the live theme was that we're celebrating. Yeah. How how almost done we are. Uh, we rented like a brush, a brush mower. Um, and so I've been, you should explain what it is because I, you talked about brush mowers all the time and it didn't mean anything to me until I saw it. And I was like, Oh, it's a weed whacker on wheels. It's a weed whacker lawnmower. Well, you just explained what it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a weed whacker lawnmower. Um, but it's really effective in knocking down a bunch of the weeds, uh, especially stuff that's overgrown and looks impossible to ever go through. Can really make it a lot easier. And when it does it, it also uh, is really easy on the back. You know, I'm exhausted because I've been doing it all day, but you know, if I tried to cover the same ground doing like hand weeding, I would have been like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's really easy to use. Like it's easy for me to use, mm -hmm. right? Like our seven year old son, I'm like, okay, this can be your job. It's maybe even easier than bucket washing. Yeah, so uh, it, it cleaned up the farm really quickly. We rented it for a bunch of days, and then we're like, oh, was, let's just get one. We were originally thinking about getting one, and now that we tried it... I think, it's, I think it was worth testing it. Oh, yeah, for sure. And so, uh, yeah, I've, I've basically just been doing that, cleaning everything up. There's, like a, there's our shipping containers, um, which are obviously used for storage. And just below them, there's an area that I like to call the junkyard. And it used to be a lot bigger. There's a lot more junk in there in the past, but there still is <clears throat> junk in there. And it's still spread out, kind of like how it originally was when I just, I was like, I need to put big things down in a pile somewhere. So I'm putting them all, you know, in this quote unquote junkyard area. Bo's, Bo's doing the thing. I know. Like, Bo, if you're gonna do the crime, you gotta do the time, right? He wants to be grabbed. So, uh, um, I wanna, basically, it had been totally overgrown by weeds, and I wanted to move all that stuff, 
And there, you know, there's eight beds or so worth of space uh, that that junkyard took up that we can, you know, start working on opening up. Yeah, or even more. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so it's good amount of real estate. And now that uh, you know that lower area is kind of like finished, it's time to you know final stage farm expansion. Well, right? No. Oh, I I don't know. I don't know where we've this talked is about going. Because a lot of our beds are fifty feet, and so we could go fifty five feet. We could go like bringing the far the road shorter. Yeah. Yeah. We've talked about it. I think, but we made it where it was because you wanted to be able to drive your truck past it with because of the um, septic field. I know, but it, it could still be more now in the area past the yeah, past the yeah, septic yeah. field. Yeah, in other areas, right? <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, I'm I'm excited to get everything all cleaned up. You know, this year. Has been uh, we're trying to like invest into ways that we can make money without you know the same amount of effort, and so one of the parts about everything being more efficient from my perspective is uh, I want the whole farm to be uh, able to be controlled with like the riding lawn tractor. Right now, there's all these areas of the farm where there's rocks that I dug out of you know farm beds and tossed or you know there's humps of dirt that were from a project at some point in time and now you know they're in the way and so our riding tractor gets kind of shut out of areas and then uh, those areas have like big weeds grow into them and they go to seed and they just you know seed the farm and so but now if everything if all the rocks are finally dug out and they're put over in the rock pile or along the fence line no rock pile or <laughs> They, they, um, it, it makes it so that it's safe, you know, once I kind of take off some of the dirt piles, it's basically safe everywhere to take the lawn tractor. And then, you know, once you're cutting it, it's, it's easy. Uh, if it doesn't, yeah. then it will have the weeds grow up in it. So that's, that's. Other than the fact that it's all weeds because it's grass. Yeah. It's still, <laughs> but you know, the farm is going to look really nice. looks really year. good. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's going to look cool. But, or I should say, because I saw someone asking if we still have flowers, it looks really good for everything being dead. Oh, here look. Because, oh yeah, the, the last of the flowers there, are three-week-old marigolds. So marigolds will, like, root in water. So these are, these are, like, roots that have grown from them being in the water here. But, yeah. Um. The, we, we had a hard freeze, not just a frost, but a hard freeze about three weeks ago. So everything is like very, very dead. Though I popped into one of the tunnels today and there, the anemones in the tunnels that have started to grow again. Um, just scabiosa. Cool down. I saw some scabiosa that was really? growing. Yeah. Down at the bottom of the farm. Like self-seeded? Like not... Down the bottom? I don't know. Oh, the perennial one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. And I saw some snapdragons at the top. They're like, ooh, coming back. Oh, yeah. Because snapdragons love the cool. Yeah. Yeah. But, like, we're, we're racing the snow, basically, at this point. Well, right? The, well, yeah, but it could last year time. it had snowed by now, right? Yeah. Like, but... last year, the reason why it's such a strut, why it feels... So urgent. Are you gonna put that back in the water? Yeah. <laughs> you don't want you don't want your marigold to die. Yeah, I I need that in three months from now. So just keep it in there. Oh, I am exhausted. I'm dirty. I'm gonna go have a shower. Okay. After I put the dirt in my face a little more. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you do when you're dirty. I'm sure I made an engaging video. Oh yeah. <laughs> but. but we haven't filmed anything in a long time. Did you tell them that? No, I haven't really talked about it because you came in yeah. like when it just first started. Uh, yeah, we uh, not really been. We didn't filmed any of this like cleanup stuff. Yeah, we we were too busy. We decided we had to prioritize getting the work done. I think so, it'll make for better videos in the long run. You know, if we if we had to film it all, then uh, it takes a long time to do something and to film it. So we just. 
you know, we've been so needing this catch up time to get the farm all cleaned up that uh, it'll make it so that we have more time in the future to do stuff. And it'll also make the farm look like really good and help us along professionally, which will just make the videos more interesting, right? It's like the business, the business needed a little bit of time investment to get you know, the farm, I should say, the farm needed a little bit of time investment to uh, get back on track. Yeah, totally. And and then, you know, we can start filming again once, you know, it's not, it, it would be like a, it'd be like a 40 minute work montage if we're like, so welcome, you know, to Red Roof Family Farm. And this week we got some cleanup to do. And then it's just like 40 minutes of time lapse. Well, I don't think any, uh, <laughs> I don't think anyone actually wants to see you move the junk pile. I don't think anyone, yeah, yeah. I don't think anyone commenting saying like, oh, I can't wait to see it. Is talking about watching you. I don't know, it's being sarcastic. <laughs> but I know people do did want to see planting the peonies, and they did want to see planting the tulips. But I really didn't want to see us doing it in the snow again. Yeah. So we had to. Yeah. And then this week, <clears throat> like when when we have a little bit of time, um, then we're gonna do like a final farm tour. And we'll show you guys all the stuff. Yeah. Then yeah. it'll then it'll be impressive. Yeah. We can go. Doo, 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 doo. Yeah. You know, the, we can be like, look. And then it can be like magic, right? That's the fun of these videos. It's like all this work happens like magic. Okay, bye. <laughs> um, yeah. No. But we we still have like two vlogs from the summer, like when we were doing the farmers market left to edit. Um, so we just I was like, we could film, but <laughs> we're probably never going to get to it if we film. Um, yeah, so we, and then the other thing, so another question there, you guys are asking about the holiday markets. So the other reason why there was like a time crunch um, on this is, so we have a holiday market for the last weekend of November, and then we have a holiday market for the first weekend of December, and I still, <laughs> I still haven't started on it yet. Um, Though I have like everything on hand to get to get started on my prep for the holiday markets and I, and because um, I'm basically doing again what I did last year, there's not like it's it's fairly organized. You know, the first time you do something, the second time you do something, you don't know how you're going to do it. Um, so the just the getting coordinated on it all takes takes a lot of the time. Um, you know, trying to figure out what your market setup is going to be, right? Because this is different from our farmer's markets. Um, you know, that, that can take like a week of work. Oh, I have to find merchandising <laughs> displays that are different from the farmer's market. Um, but I don't have to do that because we do have experience at this. Um, so, you know, it's, it'll take a week of sitting down and making Christmas ornaments um, we also did a bunch of prep work in the spring. Ian prepped up a bunch of status that's like ready. All the status that I grew this year isn't even for the Christmas ornaments. Um, we're using last year's status, which is, you know, we had it all bagged up and ready to go. It's like pre prepped by color. Um, and then the straw flowers, the way we've been saving them this year, um, it's gonna make it really fast. Like I just grab a bag of straw flowers, boom, the ornaments go together. Um, so I'm, I'm not too worried. And Nellie is, is still here and working with me. So, you know, between the two of us, like a week and, and we'll be good. We'll be good to go. Still, I'm crossing my fingers. I want to make $10,000 before the season officially ends completely. Um, so that means I need to sell, you know, if my Christmas ornaments are $10 each, that means that I need to sell a thousand of them which means I have to make a thousand of them or more so I have to get on it and and yeah so that's another reason why woo woo celebrating celebrating being pretty much done the outside work it it feels really good um yeah and then for oh, what was coming it's coming to do the thing again um yeah so so I'll go to questions um, if you guys want to get questions in the chat, if you have anything, um, if you put them in caps, 
makes my life easier. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm really excited. I'm really excited to be almost done. Um, you know, oh, the, the other thing I was going to say is, um, I'm working on our computer broke, so we couldn't even work on videos. We had to like wait till our computer got fixed. But so I'm like almost done a video um, that is my tulip unboxing so that you guys can see all the tulip, all the different varieties. Um, you know, it's full of all the details about what, what grows well, what doesn't, why, you know, the reasons for everything. It's an hour, so it's a bit of a schlog, but it's, it's full of like what I consider pretty good information. Because at this point, most of the most of the um, varieties that I'm growing have grown for a bunch of years. Um, so like I have experience to share on them. And then I also am gonna pretty quickly um, work on, I know Bo's purr, um, pretty quickly I'm gonna be working on the peony unboxing um, so I can share with you guys all the details about the peonies because I can't wait, I can't wait to see what they're gonna look like. I know at least a few of you are as, as impatient as me to get an idea of, of what that peony field's gonna look like when it blooms. Um, and then after that, we're gonna, we're gonna film the, the farm tour and, and let you guys see just how good it looks. For the first time ever, Red Roof Family Farm actually got organized enough to clean itself up for in the fall instead of saving it for the spring. Let's see. Uh, feel free to put out your supplies and work on ornaments while chatting with us. Ah, uh, yeah, I, w I wish, I wish I was that organized because they are, it is like a, it's like a total, it's the perfect thing to do during live video. Next live video, I can do them. I can tell you guys all about, about how that's going. Um, but I need to, I need to dig through, <laughs> dig through the room. You know, if I like tilt this, um, you can see my, my dried flowers, they are still a mess. I still have a dried flower mess everywhere. Um, it's not quite, no, oh, don't do it. It's not quite organized enough to be at the point to be putting the ornaments together. Almost, almost there. <laughs> I need, to, I spent, so I bought the ornaments that I'm gonna use to fill in it like for Boxing Day, like right after Christmas last year. Um, I bought like every single ornament left because they were all on like blowout sale that I could get my hands on. Um, and then I stacked them into the dried flower room. And then I proceeded to then fill the room to the ceiling um, with dried flowers. So in order to get the ornaments, I have to unpack the entire room to find the ornaments before I can start doing the work. So that's part of the reason. That's part of the reason why why they've been procrastinated on yeah so i don't I, like i'm amazed usually guys have like a million questions uh, i was like oh we didn't do a live video last week we had the members live video the first um monday of every month um is is live that we do with just the members um and then uh but I didn't do one the week, I didn't do a live video the week before because we were busy. Um, so I was like, oh, we gotta make sure we do one today. <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna stop editing the video. Gotta make sure we do it. Cause I'm sure people have questions. Um, okay, let's, uh, audiobooks. What audiobooks am I currently listening to? Um, what? I never actually know anything about the audiobooks that I'm listening to. I'm just like, so if, if anyone doesn't know, I'm obsessed with audiobooks. I listen to about two audiobooks or more a week. Um, but I listen to them out loud because I don't like having like headphones in. So I'm always trying to make sure that they're not, they're not going to be inappropriate stories being told out loud for everyone to hear, like the neighbor children. Um, so I'm like, okay, it has to be young adult fiction. And then I like fantasy stories, like fantasy romance stories. So the way I find audiobooks is I use like my audio, my library's audiobook app. It's called Libby. And then I get like free, like whatever's available for my library. And, uh, and I, uh, and I, um, 
oh, you're distracting me. Um, yeah. And j when I finish one, I'm like, what do you recommend next? And so then it just gives me an infinite list. And some are really bad. Some I'm like, this is so bad. I don't know if I can continue. But I know that I have to like, like, if I don't listen to this, I'm going to have to put in the effort to find something else. Um, so I usually just keep listening to them. Um, and then every once in a while, I completely run out of things. And then I have to like re-listen to things again. And I'm almost, I'm almost to that stage. Um, so I'm like, the one that I'm listening to is really good. And it's one that I've listened to again. But even listening to it a second time, I can't even remember what it's, what it's called. Something thorn. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. If you want, if you want my rec, but my book recommendation, I made Ian listen to me for a year straight being like obsessing. Like this book is so good. Everyone should go and, and read or listen to the Witcher series books. Uh, cause they're so good. I really like them. And then one that I listened to last year that I was like, oh, this is so good. And I'm really excited because there's a Netflix show coming out is uh, The Three Body Problem. That one was like excellent. And that was like what I looked for in an audiobook. Each of those books was like 25 hours long. So I was like, perfect. It's a whole week of audiobooks. I don't need to find two 12 hour books. I can just have this one mega long one. Yeah, I like that one. And then uh, I also, this over the winter and the spring, I listen to all the like Bridgerton. I, I listen to anything by the author of the Bridgerton books that I could get. And they're pretty good for my rule of not having like to like have like sexy time things that you're not supposed to listen to uh, out loud when you're around children. They, they were pretty good because she had a format where it was like, ooh, like, oh, they're almost kissed. And then there'd be like some like, you know, like X-rated stuff, but it always came at the same time in the book. So I could be like, oh, it's coming. I know it's coming up. And then I could like skip past it and not traumatize, traumatize the teenager who lives next door. Um, yeah, okay, let's see. Jennifer is asking how many tulips were planted? Um, Oh, come here. Uh, oh, drive me crazy. Um, yeah, so how many tulips were planted? We bought 9,000. So, <laughs> oh, bleh. memory, sorrow, and thorn. That's not the one. There's a, the thorn one. There's like a, like a mystery at Thorn Manor is like a novel to go with the main one. But I don't know. It's a story about like, magical books and librarians and sorcerers and demons but then it's also romantic it's a romance mystery fantasy story um <laughs> um yeah how many how many tulips so this year we got nine thousand tulips and they're all planted Woo um they we the way we planted them we changed up our planting method a tiny little bit this year um so last year I'm, I'm like i'm thinking i'm trying to think of a name jenny love i think um she with the podcast um like she has like a flower farming podcast <sighs> my brain <laughs> my brain is not 100 percent working here um but i'm pretty sure it's jenny love has a flower farming podcast where she has a technique for doing tulips that involves planting your tulips into straight compost. No soil, just straight compost. So the very first year that we did like a good amount of tulips, we planted them into the ground, but because we have voles, um, we put mesh down, we dug a trench, put mesh down, and then we put the tulips in. Thank you. Totally. I think it's the slow flower podcast. That totally sounds like it. Or no, no, is it? She might be part of that one too. I don't know. Or the small, small farmer. I don't know. There's so many. There's so many. <laughs> it has been so long since I listened to her podcast because I've been too busy, too busy listening to all my trashy books. Um, but anyway, okay. So the first year we dug this trench, we put uh, metal mesh into the trench and then 
put the bulbs in, um, soil back in, ground soil, um, and that worked great. The mesh, yeah, I think it's Jenny Love. I, and I think she she's from that area. I follow her on like social media, like her like Instagram. Um, yes, that's it. No till. That's the one. It's the No Till Flowers podcast. That is that's the podcast of hers. Because I was like, what is it? The Gardening for Market podcast, and and I'm like, no, they. I know they have a podcast too. Yes, No Till Flowers. Jenny Love, No Till Flowers. That's her. That's the podcast where I got this tip from. Yeah, so year one, tulips in the ground, in a trench with some mesh in it, it worked. Um, the, the, the voles didn't, the mesh stopped the voles from getting to the tulip bulbs and eating them all. Um, but when it came to the springtime, it was really slow to pull the, the tulips out of the ground and a lot of the bulbs popped. So. So like when you're a flower farmer, when you grow tulips, you pull out bulb, bulb and all, so you can put it into the into the fridge to store. Um, and so then, so they popped a bunch, which was fine. I didn't have very many, so I was selling them fairly quickly. So I wasn't doing as much storage, um, but they also were really dirty. The They were like full with this heavy dirt. Um, and so I was like, well, Jenny Love says there's a better way. She says that she plants them in compost. And there's another thing that I didn't even think about that we finally dealt with this year. Two years later, we, left, we had that mesh in the ground, right? So we had to dig a trench to put the mesh in. But when you pull the bulbs out, it doesn't lift the metal mesh out of the ground. And it's metal mesh. We can't like take the tiller to it to break it up um, and just not dig it out. Um, so recently, we uh <laughs> like i had someone who's been coming to help on the farm and i was like okay today i have one job for you and it is spend an entire day like doing back breaking labor of digging this metal out of the ground um and i was very glad he, he was he was happy to do it um and i was very happy to have someone do it because we had literally abandoned three farm beds on the farm because there's this metal in here and we just didn't ever have time to deal with it. So hindsight, learn from my lesson. Don't stick random metal into your ground because that is a nightmare to remove from your ground and leaving it in the ground is an even bigger nightmare than putting in the effort to take it out. So we don't do that anymore. We do Jenny Love's technique. And what she does is um, she plants it in compost, raised beds, with compost. So what we are doing, I think they're like either, I, I can't remember if they were, if they're, I think they're two by sixes. So two, two by sixes high. So it's like, you know, 11 inches tall. And then, so we've created like a box. This is what we did last year. We created a box that's like 48 feet long. Um, and then on the bottom of the box, when we were building them, we stapled um, hardware cloth. So it has the metal mesh on the bottom to keep the keep the voles out. And then it has the wooden sides to keep the voles from going in on the sides. Um, we put it in place, we put compost in. So the reason why compost, it costs money. Oh, Bo, you're so bad. <laughs> he, it's like he knows, he jumps down to do this. Oh, you drive me crazy. Um, yeah, so compost, is really light. Um, so the amount of work that it takes to dig out a trench with garden soil, it's heavy. And that's that's with like my like dry sand pit soil. If you have like clay soil, digging like this huge trench to plant your tulips is like not a fun job. But um, like me and the person that I've been working with, um, you know, it, filling these these beds it's like so fast it's so easy the compost is nice and light it's like super it's easy to work with you know we have it in a mountain so it's not even like we're digging completely from the ground a lot of it is kind of like higher up easier on the body um yeah so filling the raised beds with the compost um you know we start with like an inch or two for the bulbs put the bulbs in and then they cover them up so they you know they kind of have like eight inches on top of them 
of compost and then it, the other perk right so sweet you already like saved time in not having to dig heavy soil in in doing compost instead um, but it's expensive right compost costs money um, raised beds cost money but the the place where you actually save the money is when it comes to spring when you lift them out of the ground they lift out super super easy like four times easier four times as fast hardly any break um, and then also the compost is a lot easier to actually clean off of the stems and everything. So not only do you clean things four times as fast, you pull them out four times as fast. And when you're doing any sort of volume that very quickly pays for the cost of the, of the compost itself, especially because you can still like, after you take the bulbs out, you can still use the compost. The compost is still ready to get moved from from being used with the tulips onto another spot. It's kind of just like winter storage. Um, so it worked great. Um, but so the one thing that we're doing different this year though, is last year we did this 48 foot long bed by, you know, I forget like three feet wide or something. Um, and this year um, we decided that, cause we realized like working with like moving emptying out a 48 foot long bed is a pain in the butt. So this year, instead of 48 feet long, we made four 12 foot long beds. And so when it comes to what, like for even moving them around to put them in place, um, it was like really difficult for me and Ian to move the 48 foot long bed. It's like all twisty and falling apart as we're moving it. Um, where's the 12 foot long bed? Ian, Ian just like dragged them into place. Um, you know, we were able to like fit them really precisely. Um, they were also a little bit more flexible for where we could put them. Um, they're also, they're kind of, they're technically kind of temporary because they get emptied by May. So we could put them in a spot where we don't want anything to grow in the summer. Um, you know, and especially when we're working with these 12 foot beds, it's way easier to empty it out um, and, and to carry it somewhere else for storage, you know, or to stack up four for storage um, and only have a 12 foot long. Um, but yeah, so the plan is that for what happened last year is, or this spring, <laughs> I'm already in 2024. Um, so this spring, it was super, super hot. The tulips didn't fully develop. Not some of my later blooming varieties didn't form proper buds because it got too hot too fast. Um, and then some of them, they just opened too quickly. So I wasn't able to harvest them. So the raised beds that we had from last year, we still have tulips in them. And that's part of the reason why we only had 9,000 this year, because um, there's probably gonna be, because last year, I think we had 13,000 planted. You know, the beds, they hold almost 5,000 and I have two full beds out um, and I probably only picked a third, maybe half, right? But so I'm, there is a very good chance that I'll be getting like 5,000 tulips coming again in the beds that I already planted. Um, so those I'm going to have, we didn't plant anything in them because we just left the bulbs. And so that's, we didn't reuse the raised beds last year. Um, but this year, the hope is that, um, that we will, the hope is that we'll sell every single bulb, those ones bulbs that we didn't get out. And a few of them are varieties that maybe we wouldn't want to sell. Um, there was a couple things that were kind of like home garden stuff that got mixed in, um, you know, I bought this variety called Red Dress because we ran out of time. So we, pl we couldn't plant them in our home garden. But yeah, so I got a variety called Red Dress that I wanted for my gardens, not for the farm. Um, so I would like to not sell all those if, if I can find them, <laughs> if I can recognize them before, um, before I pull them to sell. Um, there's, there's a chunk that is Disneyland Paris. It's this really beautiful double orange that we really <laughs> like. Um, and we had purchased, I think we purchased like 300 of them, 400 of them, 500 of them last year, but the plan was to only sell half of them and keep the other half for the home garden. So a bunch of those I'm going to save. And then there is a, a collection of multi-flowering 
tulips. And I do like them as a cut, but they're a little short. Um, so they, they'd be great for Mother's Day if the timing lines up for doing like vases. Like last year on Mother's Day, we did, we had these vases and then we had like the tulips and we made a really, really pretty arrangement, um, that did well. And you know, the, these double flowering ones would work really great in, in a shorter vase to do something a little bit more formal. So if the timing works, I'll use them for that. But yeah, so I want to empty those. And then Ian and I have been talking about potentially dabbling in doing a, doing a U-Pick. We're about giving a very, a micro U-Pick experiment a try. Um, because uh, just looking at the, I'm taking a peek here. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you guys about the U-Pick idea but I was, I didn't see. Yeah. Um, yeah. So some, just before I like go, because I'm basically done talking about the bulbs. Um, some people were talking about like squirrels and mice and things like that. So the voles are for us are mostly coming up from the bottom. So the hardware cloth metal keeps the voles out of our bulbs. And then the sides, the wooden sides keeps keeps the voles from coming in on the side, but a hundred percent, if we had squirrels, um, even, even some birds, like I've, I've seen, I've seen like crows <laughs> dig around in the garden or mice, anything like that. They'll, they'll kind of dig down from the top and get, get into the bulbs. Um, for us, we've never had an issue with that. And I think part of the reason why is because we also like, the when you do the bulbs as annuals it's not like they're always there right so it's not like you you train them like oh anytime you want a snack squirrel just like come grab one of these bulbs they kind of they go in at the end of the season and then they come out quite quite quickly um but if you did have issues with with stuff coming in on the top with the raised bed system you could just put a lid on it right because nothing kind of really starts to grow above ground until you get like the weather right so if this is like the raised bed right you got the hardware cloth on the bottom you got the wooden sides you could get you could get like a piece of board um and just like lay it across the top or you could even you could tarp it as long as you know they weren't going to climb in under the tarp and still eat everything. But yeah, if you put a lid on it as soon as you plant them and then you just take the lid off in March when the weather starts to warm up, um, then, you know, that, that could help. But I definitely, you know, I feel sorry for all of you guys that have the squirrels to deal with because that's, that's really difficult because I, or like rabbits and things like that. Cause they'll, they'll come and they'll eat out your crop even in the spring period. Um, yeah, it's, you know, we get voles sometimes who've like found the the bulbs by the time spring comes around, but they usually it's it's so short of a period that they find them that they can't. You know, it's like one finds them, so he eats a hundred, um, but you know there's still the ten thousand, um, or they eat them, but the flower still blooms like the it was a bud, and then they eat the bulb, and I'm like, okay, well, it doesn't really matter because <laughs> you know I'm still I'm pulling it anyways. But yeah, no, really frustrating. Um, okay, so you pick. Okay, let's see. I had it. I had the chat paused. Just one repeat there. Um, yeah. Yeah, and you know, like, I think that's one thing too about like the home garden, right? Because I don't, like in my home garden, we have we have tulips and, and they're fine. Um, but the difference between like flower farmers is like, in a single bed, there's 5,000. There's so much to eat. Whereas like in, in my home garden, they're scattered around. So I'm sure every year I lose like clusters of the, of my tulips and my bulbs and everything. But because I have like, you know, 100, 150 different clusters when they come and they eat out a couple, you know, I don't, it's kind of, I don't really notice even that there's a gap and because it'll be a cluster and then there's nothing else around it. Maybe they'll find that, but they're not going to find the one over here. Um, so yeah, but yeah, really challenging, you know, the, the pests, right. Especially because so many of these bulb things are really expensive. Um, it's the thing that like hurts my heart is when the voles get into like the ranunculus and the anemones, cause they're, they're little tiny tubers. 
Um, and they're like often in the greenhouse where the voles really want to be in the spring. And then that's like, oh, painful. I'm like, oh, it's so expensive. Oh, oh please don't eat those. I'm, you're not my friend. Um, which is like another reason, like, cause some we're borderline, but some people will plant anemones and ranunculus in the fall. And then just the same as tulips, right? Once the weather hits the right conditions, they bloom. Um, but it, you know, ranunculus are like twice as much money as tulips. Um, so it's, it's a little bit scarier to have those just left out to be, to be rodent snacks. <laughs> yeah, Jennifer's like, no, don't tell me that. Yeah, it makes sense. Like someone's saying the squirrels don't go into their green stocks, like in pots, right? Like they, they'd be less likely to dig in pots and especially like a, a layered pot. They wouldn't necessarily think there's going to be dirt on the top of a tree. <laughs> yeah, no, my condolences for all of your squirrel problems. Um, the we have a squirrel that lives on the property it's like the one thing that my cats like don't try don't chase after the cats leave like there's woodpeckers and they don't the 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 woodpeckers will like fight fight my cats for sure even though they're like smaller birds and there's crows and my cats know that crows are scary and so to not bug the crows but like a squirrel my cats are like big enough that they could like go after a squirrel and win um but they're like no too much work but if if i like i'd be like oh i don't know maybe i have to get a dog or something if we started having an infestation of squirrels because they can cause so much damage okay so um i saw there was a question about the high tunnel so i'll quickly answer that and then i'll tell you guys about this um this you pick idea and then you guys can tell me what you think because this is something that we're just kind of still playing with um, so tunnel. So in the summer, we, in June, we had that, um, the wind, the like tornado thing, take out our high tunnel. Um, and I know we kind of didn't ever do like much of a follow up on it. Um, because it just, it like, it hit the metal, scrap metal pile. And then it was, it was kind of like, yeah, on, on to other things. But so what ended up happening is, so how a high tunnel works is it's basically just like hoops. It's like metal hoop pieces and that you stick into the ground. So you have you like have like short pieces of rebar that you like nail into the ground along with like a metal plate that has like two holes in it. Um, and then you have on that metal plate, one of the holes goes over the rebar and then the other hole has a carabiner on it. And so you do the rebar, you put the metal plate with the carabiner on, and then you put the hoops on and it creates kind of this like whale rib system. And then you put the plastic over and then a rope kind of just ties the whole thing together. Um, so, and then we tend to reinforce our tunnels by putting like a top beam that like then connects every single one of the hoops together in like a hard a hard attachment way so because they were like connected together and then kind of like staked into the ground when the wind hit um like a bunch of them twisted right because the connecting point they like couldn't if if the wind wasn't there there's was probably a better chance they kind of would have just lifted up and then fallen down um but because they were stuck together the like the I think it was like this, right? Like this is the tunnel and the wind came and it kind of like, like the whole thing like twisted and then the front half kind of like fell apart. Um, so our tunnels are 12, 12 hoops. And I think we had about four or five of them get, get like damaged to the point that they, they're not usable anymore. But the, the other, the other half of the tunnel is still fine. And when we bought this specific tunnel, and I can't, honestly, I can't remember the name of the company that we bought it from. Um, they're in Ontario. <sighs> Multi-shelter solutions. Is that just a company I look at a lot or is that who I actually bought it from? Maybe. I don't know. Um, but 
So when we bought it, we bought two 50 foot tunnels. So in total, we had like, like 22 or 24 of the hoops so that we could put up two 50 foot pieces. So we lost, you know, like now we could have a 25 foot tunnel, which is like, it's, it's kind of awkward. Um, you know, so, um, yeah, it's just, it's a little bit too short. I'd rather have longer, but so we, ha like Ian was kind of saying earlier when he was here, we, we could make our beds a little bit longer. So because we have this 50 foot tunnel, that's fine. We could take that half a tunnel and stick it on and build like a 70 foot tunnel or a 75 foot tunnel with the, the bits and pieces that we have on hand. Um, but we just, we don't yet know what we're going to do to do that. We'd have to take down our other tunnel to have to reconfigure. Um, you know, we probably could get away with using the plastic that we have if we built, because the, the tunnel that we have right now has like a long piece of extra plastic that kind of hangs to the ground. So we could extend with the plastic on the tunnel and then just build closed in end walls for it. Um, but it's, we're, we're just not quite there. And then the other thing is, um, we have a tunnel that we took down two years ago with plans to like move it to it, to a different place. Um, and so we have a tunnel that's like ready to get put up. Um, so if, if we were going to put up a tunnel quickly, we already have one to be able to do that. So Ian and I were running out of time right? Like days are disappearing. We have to market prep. We have to like finish the cleanup. Um, but putting up these tunnels is not a massive job. Um, and it is something like that you can somewhat do in the winter where we are, because there's like, we often get, um, not that much rain, uh, or I'm like, <laughs> um, we often get like not, not that much snow. So we have periods of time, like, you know, we could have all of December be weather where we could easily do outside work. Um, so we're talking about trying to get this frame up before the winter um, and then putting our, so we have tulips that we planted into crates and which I didn't mention, I guess I said I was done with talking about tulips, but I didn't mention this. So we have tulips that we planted into crates um, in the same way that we planted the um, the glads into crates this year. So the black crates, you know, you put a little bit of dirt on the bottom, put the tulips in, compost on top. And then the great thing about that is we can move them around wherever we want. And so the ones in the crates are the ones that we plan on growing inside of a greenhouse. So they'll bloom a little bit earlier in the spring. But if we stick them in our greenhouse, they won't get any water and tulips, tulips like water. So we had been talking about leaving them exposed because they're not going to warm up until, until like February, March. Um, but yeah, so if it, we're talking, maybe putting up this frame in December, having our tulip crates under the frame without any plastic on top, then ordering in some plastic that would come in, you know, in January and then sometime in February, um, finding a day that's not super windy, throwing the plastic on. And now all of a sudden those, those tulips are going to be kickstarted and then come the come the new growing year, then yet again, we'd have the three tunnels for growing because we, we're going to need that tunnel to be in production um, by, by April, even if, even, even if we don't do the tulips because I looked at my order that's coming for my ranunculus and my anemones from Unicorn Blooms and I bought like, 4,000 or 5,000 of those, which is insane. <laughs> it's like, you know, three, three greenhouses worth. I'm like, I, I'm going to have to sell. <laughs> I'm going to have to sell off some of that. Um, I was being way too excited about them when I purchased that. Um, and then we have Lysianthus that's coming in March that we'll have to have a place to get planted. Um, we have like, I, we're going to do stock again that ideally needs to be in the tunnel. Um, so we, we are going to need some enclosed growing space. Um, too. <laughs> that's a, that's a problem with, for future Serena though. Um, right now Serena is thinking about 
if I should create more problems for future Serena. And so we've been, Ian and I have been talking about potentially doing a you pick section on the farm because when the, we have these, we have these raised beds filled with compost that are going to get emptied. Um, and it's in an area that's like fairly conveniently close to our parking area um, where we have, we don't really have anything planned for what's going to be growing there in the future as it is right now. And so the context for us talking about doing this in the first place is that we're talking about not doing the farmer's market um, in the main summer season. We're, we're talking about, you know, kind of really changing um, the, the workflow on the farm, right? The, you, you know, we've been kind of touching base on this in the live videos all year. Um, the farmer's market sales were really poor this year. Our, when we go to make our year end like money, like where did all the money come from video? Um, it's not necessarily gonna look that bad. Um, <laughs> I'm laughing. Someone else can relate to me buying too much from unicorn blooms. It's a dangerous, it's a dangerous buying source. They're wholesale only and they're Canadian only. Um, but if you want to buy a lot of stuff, <laughs> they make it very easy because they have really cool, beautiful things. Um, yeah. So farmer's market. Um, yeah, it just, it, 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 the number dropped so much that it's hard to believe that we could get it to grow to the point that it's going to make long-term sense for a business, um, at least in, in the next five years, right? I mean, economic situations change, markets change, you know, who, like, who knows, maybe there's the farmer's market has been working on developing a market that is in downtown Kelowna. I'm sure it has like a huge potential for tourism, um, you know, and in a year or two, maybe that's something that it's like, oh, that's going to pair really well with what we're doing. But as it is right now, um, doing the farmer, being committed to the farmer's market, saying that like our number one priority is the farmer's market at this point is tying us up for being able to do anything else, right? The farmer's market is on a Saturday, you know, it's full on Thursday, Friday prep to get to it. Um, that means that we can't do events on the farm. That means that we aren't available on weekends, right? We were too busy doing the market. Um, and like, you know, we're not necessarily talking about like, oh, we'll just get an employee to do it because it's not making enough money to be able to pay for an employee to do it and, and have it you know, makes sense. Um, here, let's see. What percentage of your buyers at the farmer's market buy every week versus every other week? Um, I mean, this this is an Ian question because, because he's the one who goes to the farmer's markets. <coughs> um, but, you know, there there's definitely a lot of regulars. But I don't know if, like, the majority of the customers are regulars or if it's like 25% of the people buy every week or every second week, and then 75% of the people buy from us more than once in the year type thing. Um, but you know, like our farmer's market does get a lot of tourism. We're in like a tourist area. So like, you know, we could potentially be having 50% of our sales be to people who are only in the Okanagan for two weeks. And so, you know, or may, or maybe there's someone who has like a vacation home here and every time they're here, um, they, and they go to the farmer's market, they pick up a bouquet from us, but they're not necessarily like a full, full time, um, resident. Um, so th they would still be a regular, but they wouldn't, wouldn't be every week, but yeah, definitely the percentage that are buying that are the same people coming back every single week is, is low. It's, you know, if, if you want to build a business based on the same customers every week, you know, the, the CSA type model is really good. And I will say that, like, we don't interact directly with people at our roadside stand. Um, but the roadside stand is where we have those regular customers. The roadsides, and we can, we can see it because of uh, the fact that we take e-transfer for payment. And, you know, so only part of our customers 
Um, only part of our customers are um, paying with e-transfer. A bunch of them are cash customers, but we can see every week the same names for the e-transfers. So we do know that the roadside stand does have that more every week someone's coming and buying a bouquet from us. And like the roadside stand is, is a lot more stable in it being the same customers over and over again, where I think that the farmer's market is kind of a little bit more open. Um, Cause I think the roadside stand is kind of, you know, if you know, you know, but if you don't know, then it just, it, you don't even necessarily see what a roadside stand is when you're on your way to the winery. You're just like, oh, it's a fence. Um, let's see, how many zinnia seeds do you plant a year? <sighs> well, a lot, because I always overplant zinnia seeds because they're cheap. Um, but for like numbers from last year, so our beds hold um, 400 plants, but I think the zinnia plant, zinnia, I ended up planting the zinnia beds at a five not a four. So the zinnia beds might've had 500 each. And I had three beds of Benry's Giant and one bed of Lime Queen series zinnias. Um, so in total, like I maybe had 2000 zinnia plants this last year. And to get to 2000 zinnia plants, um, I like, I probably plant like 3000, but the amount of zinnia seeds that I have on hand is like 1 million. Cause I can't stop buying seeds. I have a seed buying addiction. Um, let's see. Oh, well you still do mother's markets for mother's day and Thanksgiving. Yes. You know, and, and I think, I think that's, uh, I think that's an important distinction in us talking about, um, dropping the farmer's market. Um, we are still planning on going to the farmer's market for the spring um, because we we have tulips in the spring, but a lot, like no one else is doing tulips because it's, it's really expensive. You have to spend a lot of money on tulips to be able to have them to sell in this way. So um, they're just, there's less competition. And then if, if the ranunculus do well, there, there's a lot of demand for the ranunculus down at the Kelowna farmer's market. And yet again, there's, there's not competition for it. So we would go for those spring periods. Um, but then come like June, July, August, September, when everyone else kind of starts flooding our market with, um, the cheaper flowers. Um, and, um, there's, there in in some ways sometimes there's like maybe there's more people at the market in the summer but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's more money for flowers in the summer um so we think we'd be better off um not not going in the summer consistently at least um you know and and that's none of those holidays right but then mother's day yeah for sure we'd go to that i was like looking at some of our mother's day footage and we did, I, you know, and I was interested in this, right? Because here's another example of how, how poor the market was this year. On Mother's Day, I sent down $3,000 and I was like, oh, like whatever we can bring to the market on Mother's Day, we'll sell, right? No question, right? And so for context, we did $10,000 the Mother's Day weekend at the, at the market and the roadside stand. So we sent, I sent $3,000 with Ian to the market. He said that was the max. His truck couldn't possibly hold any more than that. And he only sold 2,600. He came back with product. He had things that didn't sell. Um, and right, like to, to go on Mother's Day to the market and have it not sell out was, was you know, in hindsight, I was, I was surprised. I was like, what? I forgot about that. Um, you know, and the context of it is that, you know, the roadside stand, I like, we maybe didn't need to go to the farmer's market because the roadside stand was emptying out. I, we, we did sell out on the roadside stand. We ran out of flowers. Um, so, you know, maybe we could have done 10,000 without the market. Maybe we could have done 10,000 just on farm. And if we, if we did, if we could sell 10,000 on farm, not have the Ian being down there selling at the Mother's Day, then that means there's potential that I'd have enough man hours over the weekend to process up 12,000, right? So maybe not doing the market if the stand is that busy 
um, you know, like may maybe the market is costing me money, um, even even on these really good days. Thanksgiving, not Thanksgiving. We definitely need it, right? And Thanksgiving sold really strong, um, you know. And there's just a little like Thanksgiving, you know, Mother's Day. Mother's Day is the second biggest flower day of the year, right after after Valentine's Day. So, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, anyway, so the, and this is this is a perfect transition um, to yet yeah, getting back to telling you guys about the U pick. So the idea is that um, yeah, and this is this is a great question. Why is the roadside stand so successful? I don't know, but we need it to be. I I the goal in the roadside stand is to make it convenient. And like to make it just incredibly convenient for the customers to make it so easy to spend money on flowers that people who wouldn't normally spend money on flowers spend money on flowers. That's like our business model with the roadside stand. It's it's building up. Right. Because it's like if we want the roadside stand to do fifty thousand dollars a year, um, you know, like all you need is a thousand five hundred dollar customers right it's or no 50 no 100 100 500 dollar customers yeah or a thousand fifty dollar customers um 100 500 dollar customers right so we have a 25 week season um our bouquets are are 20 bucks right like we could do fifty thousand dollars with a hundred people who buy a bouquet from us every week um, you know, and like in our area, you know, that, that doesn't seem impossible to do. Um, you know, and then in addition to that, um, you know, we can pick up all these extras, right? We can pick up these holiday weekends where we do 10,000, 15,000, you know, and then we can pick up the, some tourist traffic, you know, and then we can get to our goal of doing a hundred thousand dollars a year without maybe even needing to leave the farm very much. Um, but I do think that we don't have enough awareness on, on the farm, um, in our local community. And I think that we don't have enough of like a relationship with our customers to the farm, right? The roadside stand is really convenient. Um, but I think that the thing that we need to take it to that next level of success is to have people care more, right? Like, so as, as it is right now, it's convenient for people, um, but that's, that's about like just them, right? If we can get our customers to like actually care about the farm itself and care about their relationship with the farm more, um, then, I, then I think that could be the the trick that we need, that that like tweak that we need um, to just kind of get the business right into the into the stride that it could hit to be comfortable and stable for the years going forward. Um, and so that is why we're kind of we're thinking about this you pick um, idea. the The idea is it would be it would be quite small. Um, we use the the beds after the tulips come out. We would plant up that space that has like the tulips in it with plants, right? So it's raised beds. It can be a system that's like really safe um, because my farm system, as it is right now, is very not safe, <laughs> um, which is fine, right? Like we have insurance. If empl like employees have insurance, um, but um, you know I like I can't the amount of trip hazards and dangers and stuff in my field are not they would not make me feel comfortable for the public to be like moving in the space oh thanks so much marcella <laughs> Woo. i'll do it i'll do it um <laughs> um yeah, so, but with these raised beds, um, you know, we can lay down landscape fabric, you know, make sure it's really level, um, like it's close to the parking area. We can then maintain like a really safe path, um, you know, doing this, you know, and if we plant this up when the beds get empty in May, 
um, you know, it'd be kind of perfect timing, right? Like they grow it like May, June, and then July, August, September, um, in the summer season, when we have a little bit more time because we're done with the spring markets, we're done with these high intensive crops like the tulips and the anemones and the ranunculus. We've done planting for the year. You know, we have a little bit more space. Then we can open up the U pick. Um, and I, I had like, we hosted a get together for the local flower farmers um, this past weekend. And there's like someone else who has a farm and she was doing a you pick this year. And, you know, I, and we'd been playing around with this idea, but it was always like, oh, it's so much work. Like, oh, I don't know. It's just, it's like, it's hard to get stuck on the farm um, when like, cause the work needs to get done. But she was saying that the way she was running hers is that she had it open for very specific windows. Um, so she's doing, I think it was like Wednesday, Wednesday evenings and then Saturday mornings. And it was like, oh, duh, duh, right? It's like, if you only have it available for a short period of time, um, you know, and there's only so much, and you have tickets for it, right? Because the other thing that I worry about is our parking lot is limited. So there's only so many people that can come to the farm at a time. Um, but, you know, she was, it was kind of like, oh yeah, totally. If I do it that way, then, um, then it has like the workflow to make everything work because our goal with a you pick isn't, isn't so much to like sell more flowers. Um, it, it's not like, oh, then we can make sure that the fields are getting deadheaded by the customers, right? That's, that's not, oh, we got a Kaya. Look at this. We got another cat, a well-behaved cat who doesn't rub on the tripod. Um, yeah, like the, the you pick wouldn't like, the idea of it isn't necessarily like, oh, we're all of a sudden going to be a you pick business. And that's what the business is. The, uh, the benefit for us in the you pick is in doing what I'm saying about strengthening those relationships with our customers, right? It's, it's about creating a space to invite our customers who enjoy the roadside stand to come into the farm and have a more intimate experience with the farm so that it deepens their relationship with the roadside stand, right? They can come and like do this special event on the farm. They, you know, they can come, they can meet me, right? Like the roadside stand is self-serve. Um, they can get names to faces um, for the farm. Our farm is not visible from the road. Right. So like when we when we put in the garden, that was really important for us because no one can see flowers growing. Right. So the garden this year was was really great for making people aware like, hey, look, it's beautiful here. Um, but to get them into the parking lot, get them to come back, be able to see the farm, even though they're not necessarily going to be stepping into the farm for the picking. Um, all these things, you know, could really, really help build the roadside stand sales, I think. Right. You know, and then if we're not doing Saturday markets, right, we could we take a chunk instead of being at the mark, you know, instead of me staying up till five in the morning to get ready for the market and then have Ian gone, like Ian get up at five in the morning or four in the morning or whatever he gets up at to do the market and he comes home exhausted. Um, maybe instead, you know, we're every Saturday is you pick farm tour experience from, you know, like nine to nine to noon right it's like come you know before you hit your wine tour come and experience the beauty of a local flower farm you know and like you know i i, I don't know i think it has potential it definitely has i think it has potential but we have to we have to you know figure out like what we're capable of doing next year and um you know having a system so that it doesn't get overwhelming because that's that's like where we're at right like it's like okay we we have too many ideas we need less ideas <laughs> so that we instead of trying to do 10 things poorly we need to do like three things well <laughs> um you know because it's it's just too hectic we need a better work-life balance um in the future yeah i'm just looking through the chat here Someone saying they prefer 
not having to deal with the crowds. And yeah, totally, right? Like that's one of the conveniences of the roadside stand. I think lots of people come to the market for like the market experience. They come to like get a snack. They do like brunch and everything. Um, but uh, you know, you have to be that type of person. Let's see, I think you once said wholesale, but you made inroads into wholesale sales this year, right? Haha, <laughs> yeah, no, that's a, that's a perfect, yeah, bring the kids from on vacation too. Yeah, totally, right? Like if, if we're not booked up on every Saturday, that gives us like more time as like a family it opens up like a few more days for us. Though we don't mind, in the summer, we don't mind working weekends um, because, you know, we're, we're happy to take Monday, Tuesday to, to be the weekend with the kids when they're not in school. But, you know, June and September, yeah, it would be nice to, you know, make sure there's time for family time. Um, yeah, no, okay, so wholesale. I'll, I'll do this and then if there's any other questions that pop up, um, then I'll, I'll do that too. Um, but if not, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna go after this. Let's see. Uh, this year I'll be doing Mother's Day market only and then focus on supplying to spe specialty florists. Yeah, totally, right? Like Mother's Day makes sense, right? But um, retail doesn't always make sense, right? If you can, you know, and like I always try to encourage people to, to look, like if you couldn't sell to yourself, for wholesale if you have to go to the market um if you have to get retail prices if you can't afford in your system to sell at wholesale prices um then then maybe you have to look at your system right because you are technically when you're being a farmer florist you're, you're being two businesses you're being a farmer who's then selling your flowers to the florist side of your business and yeah, it comes to a point when if the only money to be made is in is in the floristry side of it, then maybe you should just be buying someone else's flowers. Yeah, because the, the selling takes a long time. Um, so you, you can't be selling at wholesale <laughs> and then just doing all the, the selling labor for free. <clears throat> Unless uh, the roadside stamp, there's no labor. That's the great thing about the roadside stamp. Though I, do, I refuse to not price in. <laughs> I refuse there is there will be labor in the future just because there it, it, the system works right now and the small scale to not have to be a fairly low labor system um, doesn't mean the roadside stand will always be conveniently self-serve <clears throat> okay so what was I saying wholesale okay so yeah because I'm, I'm starting to look back a little bit at the season and yeah like the goal this year was to sell wholesale and we didn't we sold less wholesale this year than we did last year um, which is like funny. Um, but the reason is because the weather was really bad. <laughs> so, um, so we had, we had like insane amounts of crop loss this year. You know, I planted the entire farm, but I would say only about 50% of it survived. Um, and so the spring, you know, like my ranunculus anemone crop, none of that I was able to sell to florists. We sold a bunch of it retail, but it was like, it was not florist grade product, right? And, and we priced it appropriately, right? Like it didn't look super nice. So we, it, we couldn't charge the high prices. We had to sell it for less than we did last year. Um, you know, people are still getting a deal. You can't get, oh, the guy writing. Um, you can't get ranunculus for cheap, right? So, um, you know, even if it wasn't perfect, perfect ranunculus, yeah, my sedums, my sedums all died, um, which like that wasn't a huge loss. I was bummed because I like sedum. Um, but yeah, larkspur, we didn't have like a single stem of larkspur this year. Um, like all my spring crops, complete failure on my spring crops um, because we had this big, huge heat wave come in. The one redeeming factor is when the heat wave came in, the, the summer crops that kind of got planted did well. And they came on earlier um, <clears throat> than they have in the past, right? Normally our spring crops would kind of take us till July, maybe even a little bit, you know, kind of end of July um, before the summer kicks in. But because it was so hot, summer kicked in in July. And then over the past two years, I've been planting in bits and pieces of perennials. Um, you know, I'd done stuff like I'd planted five or 600 um, like perennial flocks that this year, you know, were ready and available. Um, so, you know, 
at a time when I was kind of hoping <laughs> to have a lot more stuff, you know, I had these flocks that were large enough that I was able to put them together. You know, I have like greeneries that are perennial that, you know, fillers. Um, I had like a bunch of bee balm that like was a great filler at that period of time. Um, you know, the yarrow like was there, the fever few, I had fever few, but it wasn't great this year. Um, yeah, but my, my yarrow was strong this year, but so like, like I didn't have snapdragons, right? Like I, like I had, you know, looking back, the other thing that saved my butt is lilies. Um, over the years, I've been stagger planting lilies, right? So the year before, um, 2022, I bought, I don't know, like a thousand lilies. And then like every two weeks I planted some out to kind of get a staggered um, amount of lilies. And then they kind of, they popped up <laughs> again, right? So they all bloomed at the same time or like not the exact same time because I had, so I have Oriental lilies and Asiatic lilies and the Orientals bloomed and then, or no, the Asiatics bloomed and then the Orientals bloomed. So I had a two week period of different colors like the different colors bloom at different times on the Asiatics. And then I had a two week period of the Oriental lilies and that saved my butt in June. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I kind of, I had all these bits and pieces to be able to scrape together enough bouquets to have a really successful season. But there was a lot of things that I had planted with plans to be selling wholesale. Um, and like those crops were never available. And so because half of what I, you know, had planned on having died, um, you know, when the roadside stand was very, was doing successful. And when the, when, you know, we we're being very steady with the market, we went at, like every week. Um, we missed very few markets. We even did some extra ones. We did some Wednesday markets. Um, you know, so all of that, even when the, the daily sales are low, that, you know, that brings the total sales up um, because, you know, <laughs> if we're going, then we're selling something, even if we're not selling much. Um, oh, I just saw someone, they said, they never get the notifications. So I try to go live every Monday at six o'clock. You could always just like peek. Oh, it's Serena Live. But I do a very bad job. I usually don't schedule it <laughs> until like Sunday night or Monday morning because I always forget what day of the week is. But if you're ever looking for me, I'm usually here, you know, and like two out of three weeks I'm, I've been here lately. Yeah. But so wholesale, I'm, I'm going on about my season. But what I'm saying is the whole, like, you know, like I'm very close. I'm two weeks off from like, it's done. December 3rd, December 3rd is when like officially the farm season ends. Um, you know, and I'm, and I feel really good about how this season went. Um, my goal was to do 60,000 this year. We've already done 60,000. You know, we're going to end it higher than, than my goal. Um, even though the market was really poor, you know, like the number, we still were able to get the numbers. We got the work that I needed done this year. We got those peonies in the ground. Um, the farm is, is taking shape in ways that I really needed it to this year. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm not super burnt out and Ian, <laughs> me and Ian are both only a little bit <laughs> burnt out, um, which is like, that's, that's awesome. Right. Like that's, that's great. Right. We're, we're not, we're at the point that when the season ends, we'll have energy to be able to get some work done for the channel, um, to get the channel fully back on track, you know, give the channel some full-time energy. Um, and then we'll be able to get back into the season again. Like awesome. Um, but at the same time that that is totally true, that is totally what happened for the season. The flip side of that is if I'm not the type of person who just always like, <laughs> is like very success focused and future focused, I could look, I could be very negative and look back on the season and say 50% of my crops were a hundred percent failures. 
I could look back and say, I spent $1,500 on anemones and I got $0 out of that crop. Um, you know, I, I could look back and, and say, right, like there, there's a lot of damage, a lot of, you know, like really bad failures that were out of my control. There, the, this wasn't like, oh, I messed it up. This was just straight up. This could happen any year. The the fifty percent of my farm failed, not because I did it wrong, but because I can't control the weather, and the weather is less reliable every single year. Um, you know, I could look back on the season and be like, oh, we had to shut down for a few weeks, and basically had to like restart our sales and reignite like our our customers awareness of us as you know like our entire community emptied out due to like due to like natural disasters right this this past year was was a very very hard year um you know like having a tornado take out our like our high tunnel like to, to me it's like entertaining because like, what are the odds um, very low, right? Like that's like not a thing. Um, we call it a tornado cause there's no better word for it, but they're, they're like a dust devil thing. It's like, yeah, I, I know they exist here, but not in, you know, that's another like, oh my God, the weather, <laughs> like that's, that's our weather now, I guess. They're like a when I was a kid, dust devils, you know, I'd play with them in the street, They'd, like pulling your hair, be cool. It's like, okay, now dust devils will like literally tear like <laughs> metal in half. Cool. Um, yeah, so yeah, you know, a lot, lot of adversity overcome, I guess. Um, so, so yeah, so wholesale, um, I don't feel bad that we didn't sell wholesale, um, because like, honestly, I probably couldn't have the, I just, I didn't have the, I didn't have the, um, the volume to be able to do it. I, I was selling like most of what was on the farm for a good amount of the year. And then by the time I did have some volume, um, it was for such a small window um, because at, at that point, like our successions had gotten kind of messed up because we were kind of scrambling to, to deal with a lot of the craziness. And so, you know, if things had been more on track with the, with the, um, with the crops and the success and the wholesale plan earlier in the season, we would have been able to continue with the wholesale. Um, but um, because we hadn't started, it just, it was kind of like, there's no point trying to pull it together. You know, like I think about mid season, we were, we were like, okay, let's just make sure that we're still getting a video out every week. Let's make sure that we're getting to the market every week. Um, you know, and then let's, let's reassess for next year. And like, we are really excited for next year, right? We've, we've put in, and wholesale is a part of that conversation. We put in these peonies, you know, like a thousand peonies. That's, that's not going to be, that's not going to be money for four years, probably here in the Okanagan for us, but, um, we know what we have and we have them. So now we can start letting people know that in four years, we're going to have peonies for them, right? We have the numbers that, you know, people can, you know, start thinking about us as a place to get peonies in the future. Um, I'm, you know, I still don't have everything a hundred percent figured out, but, and, and so I, and I don't exactly sometimes, and this is kind of funny, the conversations that I have with you guys in these live videos, sometimes I get them mixed up with the conversations that I have with Ian. So I'll be like, oh, Ian, remember how we're going to do this? And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. I was like, oh, yeah, I was like talking to all you guys. I never did bother talking to him about it. Um, but you, yeah, like our, our process over the winter is that we kind of we nail in things. But um big right and like the you pick is like a that's a small thing we'll see if we can work it into the system but the big things that we're working on is more efficiencies um for doing wholesale um we're we're kind of like making pivots in our crop plan in in the same way that we're that we're doing the peonies, right? The peonies was like a huge change from our way of thinking on the farm because now we're we're committed, right? We're committed to being a flower farm. We're going for it. <laughs> if it doesn't work out, 
If it doesn't work out, then we're going for the content farm idea. Veggies didn't work, if flowers don't work, then just straight up we're content farm. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, I put in an order, I think I have 1500 delphiniums coming. Um, and like that, that's a big number, but that's also just like my experiment, right? I'm like, I'm like, I'm bringing in 1500 delphiniums to see what it's a whole mix of stuff. Yeah, someone's like, we're your listening circle, totally. You guys, like, you guys help me out so much in, like, getting everything organized, right? When I, like, talk out my ideas to you guys in these live videos, and then, like, you know, you, like, make comments where you're like, I don't know, Serena, are you actually going to do that? And then I'm like, that's a good point. <laughs> I should listen to you guys. Um, yeah, so we have 1,500 delphiniums coming. Um, to give an experiment on delphiniums. I don't, I don't know how delphiniums grow here, right? They're probably not going to like it very much because <laughs> I, I think they like more temperate and more, um, more, more wet conditions than my desert <laughs> sand pit. Um, but I'm, I'm going to give them a try because that's something that would make a lot of sense for a wholesale. And if I, if I can't grow good quality delphinium, um, then my bad quality delphinium will look great <laughs> in my red side stand uh, bouquets. Um, but it's something that, you know, I can get into a system that is maybe going to be less stems per year, right? I could grow Larkspur and get like a gazillion stems, um, but it's a lot of work. Maybe I can put in these delphiniums and I only have to replace them every three years. I can start to get them, you know, into a system and every time I replace them, I replace them with varieties that are better suited to my growing conditions. I can learn a little bit more about growing them, you know, and then maybe five years from now, um, I'll know how to grow delphiniums. And now, you know, like a delphinium plant will produce a couple stems per, um, you know, and it's like, okay, if I have 1500 delphiniums and and I'm cutting 4,000 delphinium stems out of my farm, you know, and I'm selling those to florists, not even to the roadside stand, you know, that starts to work. Those pair really nicely with peonies. Um, you know, I can, I can get some great, fill up those florists for a great season. Um, I put in an order for 1,200 sedums and, and I'm kind of like, we'll do that this year. I'm not saying that's like the end of the sedum coming in. I was telling Ian today, I'm like, oh, best solution ever. Cause I'm like, I watered my sedum too much and then it died. So I have to make sure that sedum is in its own section in the farm so that it doesn't, has to have its own, it has to have a dedicated irrigation zone. So I don't overwater it. Um, but then I was thinking, I'm like the sedum probably only, even like with our like Sahara desert, um, we probably only need to water the sedum once every two weeks. I'm like, you know what? Maybe sedum is not on the irrigation system at all. Maybe I like it, it's just not watered. And I, and I like water it with the hose because if I only have to water it once every two weeks, you know, if it rains, oh, okay, I don't have to water it. Um, then, well, nothing grows here without water, but sedum is as close as it would come right sedum i could definitely get away with only watering it a few times like in the summer right so doing that with with a hose and a sprinkler is is very simple for me to do um yeah but i'm like sedum sedum something that like i could sell a huge amount to to florists i'm sure um you know that and it'll grow really nicely and really easily here and if florists don't want to buy it from me cool like i'll use it i like i could have a hundred like you know, if I have 10,000 sedum stems, right? If I, let's see, how many, if I want to do $100,000 a year, if I had to do it in $20 bouquets, then that's 5,000 <laughs> bouquets that I'd have to do every year um, with, or no, 50, no, it's not 50, that'd be $2, 5,000, 5,000 bouquets every year to do 100,000. And if I have 10,000 sedum stems, then that's two sedums goes in every single bouquet that leaves the farm. Like, poof, easy, perfect. I have my filler, I have my filler covered. So easy. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm starting to think of like, what are some things that I can just like specialize in? You know, I want, I want to get this Lysianthus figured out. Oh, thanks so much, Black Dog. You're always so generous. <laughs> I, I really appreciate that. Yeah. 
Um, <laughs> you're like, you're always, I'm like, every time you do like, so everyone say, if you're in the chat, everyone give a big thank you to Black Dog. She's like our biggest supporter ever. She like comes onto the live videos all the time and like always gives me like a heart stopping amount of money. And, but every, every time you do it, I'm like, I'm like, like, it just, it feels, it's like painfully generous. <laughs> it, like I just, whatever's in my head just like disappears. <laughs> well, I, I, you know what though? Like you know, she's saying you work hard, um, but just like you, like I, I feel like my work is acknowledged just by every time you guys even watch the videos, right? Um, you know, and, and I'm like, and I like working hard. <laughs> so I, I never, I guess, I, okay. What I'm saying is thank you. <laughs> what I'm saying is thank you because I don't feel like you, any of you guys owe me anything that you, that you give me. I don't, I don't feel like any of you guys owe me any of the money that you, that you guys ever generously like donate to us. And, and I definitely don't feel like we, you guys owe me, um, your attention even in the videos. So we're like, you know, just when everyone is so like, so generous with like their time and their money, you know, it just, it makes, it makes me feel really grateful. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. But what was I saying? Plants, plants for wholesale. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm rambling. I'm, I'm at that point where I start rambling. So I, I should, <laughs> I should probably wrap it up, but yeah. So for wholesale, it didn't happen this year. Um, but we are still going forward wanting wholesale to happen. Um, you know, and like, you know, I grew up with the movie Field of Dreams, right? Build it and they will come. Um, oh, thank you so much, Kelly. Oh, it's for the kittens. Well, they'll appreciate. I just, uh, I just spent a lot of money on the kittens. The two that are hanging out in this video, they luckily didn't get any money spent on them, but, uh, we got, we got the two kittens who haven't been in the videos very much because they're, they're still young. Um, we got them neutered <laughs> this last week. So, so we'll put it into the, the vet bill, <laughs> the vet bill pile to pay for, for, um, them not running around and making any more, any more kittens. All the kittens have to come to us. <laughs> we don't, we don't put kittens out. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. What am I saying? Field of dreams, build it and they will come. Um, yeah, like I, I, you know, I don't want, you know, and Ian and I, we have the luxury of doing things that don't make sense for other businesses, right? So like, I don't recommend other people experiment with 1500 delphiniums, you know, like we're, I'm like the delphiniums, like I bought some from a local greenhouse. And they're expensive because they're coming in like a 72 plug size. They're a dollar ninety nine, um, but we also were buying delphiniums that are smaller from Ball, and they were like under a dollar. But but yeah, like I I'm probably spending like fifteen hundred dollars, two thousand dollars on delphiniums, and I'm comfortable with like potentially not making money on that crop at all, despite the investment that I'm going to make. And delphiniums like aren't, delphiniums aren't like a perennial perennial, like the peonies where you put them in and they come back. The delphiniums, I'm thinking I'm going to have to manage the delphiniums similar to how I manage the, um, the Indian summer rubecchia and the fever few. I figure every year I'd have die off in my delphinium beds. Um, and every year I'll have to be like replacing, um, like, so if I'm buying 1500 delphiniums next year, I'll need 500 delphiniums to fill in what dies over the winter. Fingers crossed. <laughs> if, it, if it's like a th every three year system, that would make me happy. If they, if they don't, if everything dies the next year, I probably will never do it again. I'll be like, eh, too risky. <laughs> Maybe I can find something better. Um, oh, okay. Marcel's asking like, what's my reason for buying plugs? Um, so I like, yeah, I'm, I'm still going to be growing seedlings, but, um, the, 
the my experience with buying plugs from ball seeds in the lysianthus um had me look like really hard um at they had me look really hard at the what it was costing me to grow the seedlings right because the first year like the First year I tried to grow Lysianthus, I spent $100 on Lysianthus seeds and I got zero Lysianthus. So the next year when I spent $1,000 on Lysianthus plugs and I actually got something I could sell, um, that's that felt like money well spent. Um, and then the other reason why I'm doing more plugs is that as, as our farm has shifted from being veggies and flowers and it's gone into only flowers um as i the process of doing that is and and like this is this is part of that like the, what's going on in my head about the wholesale stuff and buying sedum and buying <laughs> delphinium these things that i would have never really thought about um as i'm specializing as a flower farmer um i'm not just growing the easy flowers that i can sell for cheap i'm starting to like look at my crops and be like, like my zinnia rant, like why I hate zinnias. I'm like, zinnias are too much work, right? Sure. They're beautiful and people want to buy them, but the labor to dollar value isn't that great on zinnias. It's easy to forget how much work you have to do in handling them. Um, and so I'll always have some zinnias, but I'm never going to sell zinnias wholesale. Like there's no way there's like things that I can do way better on um, on like the the labor to sales price equation. Um, yeah, and so I'm starting to look more seriously at these more difficult to grow crops. Um, and some of these more difficult to grow crops aren't, they're not more labor, right? It's like Lysianthus. Lysianthus is gonna be like a really low labor crop for me. Um, the, the thing that makes it hard to grow is that early stage. Um, so like, I recognize, like, I don't grow amazing seedlings, right? Like I'm, I shouldn't grow Lysianthus because the Lysianthus that I'm going to grow aren't, aren't going to look great. I can grow easy to grow crops and I can learn the requirements of specific crops out of my field. Um, but I don't, I don't have to learn how <laughs> to grow Lysianthus. Um, I can outsource that to like a professional grower in the form of buying plugs. Um, and then the other thing that it does is a lot of these more difficult to grow crops um, are actually really slow growing crops. Um, and so like Lysianthus, right? If I, if I was gonna start Lysianthus on my own, right? I'd be like, oh, do I have my Lysianthus seeds on hand? Because like maybe next week I'm starting them. You know, like Lysianthus, like, like you know, that's an exaggeration. Um, but Lysianthus, uh, like I probably start like mid December. And so a lot of the things that I'm buying in at this point are things that I would have had to start in January because my goal is to try to get December and January off of growing. Like I want to have like a window of freedom there and I don't want to have full, I don't want to have like, 100% growing even happening in February. Um, ideally, I'd like, I, you know, there's going to be stuff that I'm growing in February, but I can't fill my racks in February because March is the time when I need to grow most of my stuff and then stuff can go out in April. Um, so, um, you know, every, like last year we bought in Snapdragons from Ball. We bought in Stock from Ball. Um, we bought in Lysianthus. There's a few other things. I bought like a tray of status from Ball, um, which is like, how hard is it to grow status? But what I realized is hard enough that like it made a huge amount of sense to get in the status from Ball. They came and they were amazing. They were beautiful. Those plugs that I got from Ball ended up like producing way more stems in the year um, than my seedlings, right? So if, and any plant, if I can, pay, if I can get one extra cut off of it, it pays for that plug cost without even factoring in the time spent growing it. Um, 
yeah so so snapdragons snapdragons i'm not gonna buy again um there was a lot of breakage in shipping um which is fine because like i'll pinch snapdragons but they like snapdragons are a pain <laughs> and they're slow um but i can do them i've like figured out how to do them so i'm like okay snapdragons it wasn't great in in shipping they weren't further ahead they didn't actually grow that great the plugs that i got so i'm gonna i'm gonna do snapdragons myself but the stock that i've been getting from ball because this is the second year that i've gotten stock from ball um i was i was really happy with it again any anything that's wrong with the stock is my fault not ball's fault so i'm like yeah going forward right and stock's one of those ones that if if it gets too warm when you're growing it it can you can have problems like going to seed and stuff um lisianthus yeah there's no world that doesn't make sense to buy lisianthus um the status we bought more status this year there's one thing that i didn't like so last year i ordered two trays of status i ordered a tray of apricot and i ordered a tray of blue from ball and only blue showed up apricot they were like oh we're canceling your order we had a problem with our apricot and so if i was dependent on just um the status that i was purchasing in um i would have had problems right so i like the idea of kind of like hedging my bets i could get some plugs like oh like half of the plugs you know are gonna come from ball to make my life easy but then the other half um aren't and the other half all grow you know, on stuff like status and straw flowers, things that are fairly easy, but you know, maybe it'd be nice. Um, you know, it's just, it's nice to get, it's nice to get some time off. Um, and, and that has value that, you know, the time spent to grow it, you know, costs something, um, you know, especially for like me specifically, because I have two businesses, right? And so if I'm, if I can make a lot more content over the winter, because I'm taking time to like really devote to the channel here um because you guys all really love like review content and like and like top 10 content and stuff like that so that's content that's like excellent for me to make over the winter um it takes time you know like, like it takes mental power um so i have to like sit down think through it like i have to dig through all the footage um yeah so if if i can make a bunch of that type of content for you guys in january february instead of um, you know, being a crazy person <laughs> trying to grow a gazillion seedlings on, under grow lights, um, then yeah, it's, you know, the math works for me, but yeah. Okay. I'm going to go. I was trying, I was trying to keep this to only an hour and a half. I almost did it at an hour and 15. I was like, I should get going. Um, but do I ever deal with moles eating my plants? No, but I have voles or pocket gophers and they're evil and they eat everything, including my plants. But I have a hundred thousand plants, so it doesn't make or break the farm. Um, yeah, so thanks so much guys. Um, like I said, I'm working on this unboxing video for the tulips. Um, I said it was gonna be out on Friday and then it didn't get out, so soon. I have to finish it tonight. I'm not allowed to go to bed until it's done. Um, so that's coming and then I'm having uh, another one I'm gonna work on and then we'll get that tour out over the next two weeks. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll probably be back next week and we can talk about Christmas craft fair stuff, which will be fun. Um, but yeah, thanks so much. Thanks so much for hanging out. We'll see you next time.